Can I have a look at the thingy, camera yeah. thing? Yeah. Okay. Paul, welcome to the Basis uh, 2020 uh, lockdown conference on new energy and front frontline things and all that sort of stuff. Uh, probably the most important thing that's going on right now is what you're doing, apart from all the other important things. But um, the thing about it is, welcome. Just say welcome to the the Basis 2020 online conference audience. Cheers, Miles. Thanks for having me. And you're down in Plymouth, which is west of west of Devizes, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, down in sunny old Plymouth. And uh, who are you, and what's your sort of professional talent, and why did you get into this? Well, my name's Paul Townley. I'm 40 years old. I've been into uh, mechanical engineering, uh, mechanics, auto electrics since since the 90s, also computer-aided design, and I've been working for the last 20 months full-time on Nikola Tesla's cold steam engine and cold steam turbine, and uh, there's, there's various other different mechanical machines. There's a Nikola Tesla compressor, there's a pump, vacuum pump, turbine and rotary engine, and all these machines can be combined into single-stage or two-stage or three-stage machines to uh, provide different outcomes. Now behind you, you've got a magnificent printing. Just briefly, could you describe what that is? And it's, it's, a blo it's an A0, that's the size newspapers were, it's actually the life size. Yeah, yeah. So um, explain really what that is. Okay, this is, a, this is an article from 1911, uh, from the New York Herald, on Sunday, October the 15th, 1911. Uh, it was a two page spread, this is just the front cover. Um, it says, Tesla's new monarch of mechanics, marvels of the famous inventor's latest triumph, the perfect rotary engine, which yielding 10 horsepower to the pound, opens possibilities dreamed of for centuries. Now, I'll just read you the first paragraph. I won't read all of it, but it says, 10 horsepower from a tiny engine that a man could dangle from his little finger by a string. 500 horsepower in a package that a man could lift easily in one hand. Now, that was patented, and uh, the, upper, the upper machine, could you explain what those diagrams are, basically, roughly, those pictures? Sure, I mean, that's, a, that's an 18-inch rotor Tesla turbine, and these particular bits here and here are Tesla's, uh, his first ever, um, there's a couple of names for it, there's atmospheric uh, air bearing, or the other name is a self-acting bearing. And that allows the whole axle and rotor assembly to float on a cushion of air for a frictionless operation, which would allow supersonic speeds. So what are these discs, what does that actually mean in, in terms of what, what's going on here? Okay, well, the, the top is missing off, off the, the turbine housing. And in the top, there is an inlet, which allows the, the fluid, whether that be uh, superheated steam, cold steam, or uh, ambient air, atmospheric pressure and atmospheric heat to come in at the periphery and to spiral into the center like water going down a plug hole, which will transfer the heat and the pressure and convert that into kinetic energy. Now, uh, just so we know where we are, we're actually in your workshop. We're actually in the place that you do your business. Sure. Um, and we'll be looking at that in a lot, a lot more detail uh, separately and we'll, we'll edit that so that's available after the conference. Sure. But uh, could you sort of explain roughly what you did, uh, you're a mechanical engineer, you, you, you design things and, and one day you decided to do something better? Well, I'm not a qualified mechanical engineer. I am a qualified mechanic and auto electrician, but I have a, a, an interest in mechanical engineering and uh, didn't become a mechanical engineer because of I, I don't support planned obsolescence. Uh, Nikola Tesla was a mechanical well, engineer. That's, that's crucial. I mean, what do you mean by planned? What were you doing which made you one day have this eureka moment, I'm not going to do this anymore? Um, well, last, uh, in o October, November 2018, I had been 
working on a set of frictionless bearings, but these were permanent magnetic bearings and came to realise that Nikola Tesla was also working with frictionless bearings, but his were air bearings and they were of the aerodynamic type because there's two types, aerodynamic and aerostatic. Now, uh, the audience won't be as skilled as, as you are, but from a technical point of view, I want, to, I want you to use whatever is the technically correct term for whatever you're doing. And if members of the audience, forgive them, uh, don't understand what the hell that means, they, they need to know that what you're saying is correct so that please don't, don't approximate with your terms. Uh, people can look it up afterwards. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, if you could, when you talk about um, a frictionless bearing, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, and the difference between normal bearings and others, if you could sort of give a little sub-paragraph, okay. but still use the main, the correct technical term so that people can't pick holes in your argument. Okay, well, um, if you've got a, uh, a turbine or an engine that uses uh, ball bearings or fluid bearings uh, such, as, such as oil, then the kinetic energy gets converted back into heat and with a frictionless bearing, the, the heat that has been taken from the fluid is not turned back to heat because the, the rotor, the moving part of, of the, the turbine or the engine uh, isn't in contact with anything. Uh, so therefore, uh, the rotor is, is floating on a cushion of air for a completely frictionless operation, almost so it's in levitation. If, if you got a, a water wheel or a windmill um, or a wind turbine and you took them out of uh, nature and put them indoors, none of them would work, they'd be just an inanimate object. Now, the Tesla turbine is no different. If, if you don't have frictionless bearings, then if you convert heat to kinetic energy, it will get converted back to heat by the ball bearings, which kills, it kills the effect that we are seeking to um, achieve, which Nikola Tesla achieved back as early as, as 1906. So you were talking about magnetic bearings. Now, what exactly is a magnetic bearing? Okay, there's two types of uh, magnetic bearing. There's a permanent magnetic bearing and there's uh, an electromagnetic bearing. Um, I guess there could be a hybrid actually where you get a combination of permanent and, and uh, electromagnetic. Um, but they're, they're known as passive uh, magnetic bearings and active magnetic bearings. A passive magnetic bearing uses permanent magnets uh, such as neodymium magnets uh, which Nikola Tesla didn't have available uh, back in the day. And uh, an active magnetic bearing uses electromagnets and sensors to levitate the shaft. Now, permanent magnetic bearings are already prototyped and they don't... Now, what's, the, what's the basic principle here? Are you using two north poles to repel each other or what? Well, there's very but, but then you actually came up with a thing where you need to have t attracting sure. poles. Sure, yeah. There's, there's, there are a few different arrangements that do provide some stability in the X, Y and Z axis. Um, but the problem is uh, ma permanent magnetic bearings um, don't have the stiffness required for a ultra high speed uh, rotating part. Now what are you calling ultra high speed? Well, we're, we're aiming to achieve uh, supersonic in one of the stages, uh, whether that's single stage or two stage. One of the stages for Tesla's machine needs to be operating at supersonic periphery speed. Which means that the outside of the disc is breaking the sound barrier. Exactly. And that's the whole point about this. That's right, because the, the, uh, the thermodynamic laws change at that point. Which is what the whole principle, the basics of yes. this is all Yeah, about. One, one of the stages has to be supersonic. So you're t you, you were designing or you were working on these magnetic bearings and then one day you decided uh, that you, I'm not going to, you had your Howard Beale moment <laughs> and uh, you decided to, to actually go into this full time because, you, I mean, you need, you need funds to do this as well. Sure. Don't well, apologise for looking, you, you need a lot of money to do this. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, this type of work, prototyping, isn't cheap. I mean, if, if you knew exactly what you needed, then it would be. 
But know, that's what you're working on. You're working on proof of concept and all that. That's right. Yeah, we're, we're, at, we're aiming to reach uh, supersonic. So far, we've achieved 682 miles per hour and using ball bearings. And the rotor using a the thermal imager was minus 16 degrees and the bearings were at 40 degrees. So uh, it was pretty close. It was pretty close. But the rotor was made out of stainless steel 316 and the end plates of the rotor warped at 682 mile an hour, which put it out of balance and slowed it down. Now, what do you mean by, uh, um, what, what grade of stainless steel is that? Well, stainless steel 316 is typically used uh, for marine applications because it's got very good anti-corrosion properties and uh, it's used on handrails a lot in, uh, in you know, shiny handrails and uh, it's, it's not really suited to the purpose other than it's very good for, uh, for hot steam, or your superheated steam or cold steam because uh, the anti-corrosion properties. We were just kind of finding at what point will this break and then if the, what's called the MPA, the tensile strength of uh, 316 is 550 and we can reach 682 mile an hour, we, we've now moved to a, a, a hardened and tempered surgical steel uh, which is stainless steel 420 or you can use 440 which has an MPA of around 1400 to 1600 which is higher than titanium. And what does that MPA mean in terms of what you're heading for? Well you can, there's, if you go online or go for a, an MPA convert to, to, to PSI uh, converter you can see what that is in, in uh, oh, that, per square that, inch. Is that meters per area? Um, do you know, I'm, I'm not actually sure what, what it stands for to be honest, but uh, you know, if you look at titanium, grade 5 titanium, which is aerospace uh, grade, that's got an MPA of 950 uh, and then if you put, convert that into uh, PSI, I think it's about 100,000 uh, PSI. That's uh, pounds per square inch in, in old yep. money, right? Yep. So where, where um, What's the basic workings of the machine? What really is the basic principle of what Tesla invented? And you also, that, I mean, this has been covered up for a hundred years because it was, it was one machine split into two patents. Could you explain sure. all that? Sure. Well, um, Tesla built his first one in 1906 and by uh, 1909 he'd submitted uh, a US patent application. Uh, the US patent office uh, denied the patent application uh, and Tesla split the patent application into four different patent applications which two of which were denied and two were accepted which split the pump and the turbine uh, into two separate patents and this has caused mass confusion across the world because nobody had any of the other countries uh, patents until at least 98 when the British and Canadian patents surfaced, but still no one had figured out that the British patents and the Canadian patents weren't actually the same. They, they were less doctored, they, they were less messed with. Now what exactly do you mean by doctored and messed with and why was it refused? Why, why was this patents refused? Well, quite often they refuse um, a patent because th there's prior art that, uh, that has been submitted, um, but we haven't fully got to the bottom of uh, why the, the turbine and pump were separated into two machines but I do know that the, uh, the compressor and the single stage Tesla turbine uh, were denied because the, the, the text and the diagrams were too similar to the turbine and the pump. Wait, because they really were one machine in the first place? Yeah, I mean the original patent was for actually it was for a two-stage machine and it could be a combination of either a turbine and pump or a, a turbine and, and a compressor or a rotary engine and pump or a rotary engine and compressor. There was actually four machines within the one pattern. Now, from what I understand, this is part of a group of designs that he was actually designing for a wingless aircraft, is that right? That's correct. So there's, uh, a, whole, there's a whole group of patents here, sure. which could you explain what all that really means? Yeah, there's, there's um, off the top of my head, there's about 20 interlocking patents 
that all form together to form the basis for Tesla's airship, uh, which had no propellers, no gas bags and no fuel tank. And it, Tesla had designed everything from the engine, the instrumentation, the, the lightning protector and all the equipment to balance uh, the rotating high speed moving parts. Now, how is this going to move forward? Are we talking torsion fields here? Well, the simplest way to explain it is that um, the how does this how does a wingless thing just move? I mean, how does it get up and how does it sure even fly? I mean, how does it get off the ground? Okay, well, essentially, the uh, the rotors on the on the flying machine, uh, there's two rotors. Neither of them have shafts, so. The rotors are started off in a uh, horizontal position, so that would be uh, at 90 degrees. And so you're pointing to the discs in the center there? That's right? correct, yeah. Okay. So, so the discs would be rotated in the direction which creates lift, and one of the rotors would be responsible for the lift, and the other rotor would be responsible for the acceleration. Now, what do you mean? one of the rotors would go in the direction of lift. How does it get up? I mean, how does this work? Okay, well, one, one of the rotors uh, needs to be spun to supersonic speed, at which point the, com the compression and rarefaction of uh, the, the air is creating its own vacuum. So because it's creating its own vacuum, it's created a draft through the machine, which allows atmospheric pressure and ambient heat to rush into the inlet and convert the heat into kinetic energy to maintain the supersonic speed. And what does that mean? How does that make something lift? Well, when the rotor spins one way... We're not talking anti-gravity here. We're not talking anything like that. Well, what we are, what we are talking about is shifting a, a colossal amount of air through a very fast rotating mechanical machine uh, which, like a hovercraft, uh, creates a downdraft to, to push on. Very similar to how a hovercraft works, but we're, we're moving the air at much greater uh, so we're using, masses. We're using differential pressure, which, which is how an aircraft we're, we're, works. We're actually lifting using mass rather than velocity, because um, a, a jet plane is using uh, high-speed high velo velocity to uh, move itself through the air and the wings create the lift whereas the Tesla machine is, cr is actually shifting mass uh, through, um, through the machine so it's the mass that is creating the lift. Now what you, are you talking about the mass of the air or the water molecules in the if, air? If we, were talking about, if we were talking about electricity or, or water we'd be talking about current, the, the volume, we're, we're using volume to move to to fly with rather than velocity. Now, explain that a little bit. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think on the patent he ended up having to put a propeller on it and sure. wings just to get the damn thing through. Is that right? Yeah, I mean that's an interesting. He just drew part. those on, stuck them on, and, the, and then he gave him a patent. I mean, I mean, he patented it in in uh, a number of countries in 1921 with no fuel tank, but. The U.S. Patent Office denied the U.S. application on the grounds it had no fuel tank, so Tesla had to do an amendment patent in 1927, which got approved. Um, the two patents got approved together in 1928, and, and the latest Tesla it was last Tesla's last ever um, patent that got accepted, and it so he added all his golden nuggets into his final ever patent, which combined a pulse detonation engine steam boiler with a turbine and rotary engine uh, twin, twin machine uh, for Tesla's final design. And you are actually working on that sort of stuff? Sure, we've already replicated the uh, Tesla's pulse detonation steam boiler and that produces superheated steam at low pressure, which is extremely safe compared to normal superheated steam. In other words, steam. we're not talking steam at, 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 at 200 degrees Celsius or something. We're, we're talking um, around, uh, say, about three, 300 degrees Celsius to about 600 degrees Celsius. So, I mean, it's if you got hit by that, burned by that, it's, I mean, it's what, low what pressure. It's only about one to two bar. So, 
yes, it would burn you very, very badly if you put your hand in the way, but it's not like superheated steam under pressure, which can cut someone in half. Yeah, like we have in conventional boilers and steam engines and ships and stuff like that, and power well, they, stations. Well, they walk around, if they hear a whistle on a ship with superheated steam, they have to send somebody out with a broom to put it by the pipes. And when the end of the broom gets cut off, then they know they found the leak. Ah. So that's, that's, high, that's high pressure superheated steam though. Yeah. You know, like say one to 2000 PSI. We're, low, we're only dealing with about 14.7 to 30 PSI. Right, okay. So, so, where, so let's get down to your, uh, you, you've done computer aided design uh, of, of technology, so of engineering parts, is that right? That's right. Um, I've done so that's your bread and butter? Um, well, or was your bread and butter? My bread and butter was being a mechanic and an auto electrician, uh, predominantly fixing uh, cars with electrical faults uh, that other garages can't fix because there's a, a big lack of auto electricians in, in the country. Lots of mechanics, but not yeah. many auto electricians. Yeah. And of course, cars are getting much more sophisticated and all that sort of stuff. Sure. All the I mean, the CAD's just been a, a, a hobby, really. I've, ne I've never done it professionally, but because I've got experience dating back to 94, 1994, um, I can work with the CAD guy and, and sit there and tell him what to draw and lean on them for their materials and, and uh, technical expertise and together form good teams to uh, you know, produce some very high quality components. So you are, the whole point about this is you are able to take Tesla's patents and you're able to physically make things which you can then develop into something which can be proof of concept for an industrial version, uh, you know, a manufactured version of this technology. Exactly, yeah. Um, but you've got the added ability of using modern bearings and metallurgical science to do stuff that Tesla wasn't able to physically do do at the time is that sure right? is that right is yeah that's correct i mean we've got much higher tensile strength steels available now um i mean tesla was using a material called ger german silver which is now known as nickel silver which is a nickel alloy and uh that's got about an mpa of about 550 similar to stainless steel 316 so we're using um about 1400 to 1600 mpa uh hardened and tempered steels now but the main thing is that what we've learned from Tesla's patents is that Tesla made the patents as a lesson. If you copy the picture the te and the text, the, t the, the text that doesn't make sense will come alive and make sense. He he's literally teaching from the grave and only a master genius could weave a jigsaw puzzle as big as this. But you've recognized this. You're sure. showing elements of master genius then. <laughs> well, um, I'm just a good replicator, you know, I'm, I'm uh, open-minded and luckily I haven't uh, had the uh, mechanical engineering training that's told me that this, these things are impossible. Um, one of the things that we discovered was that the second law of thermodynamics is based on the work of a 28-year-old called Sadie Carno, a Frenchman, and he theorised a theoretical frictionless piston engine uh, that was a closed system and the problem with that is you can't have a frictionless piston engine so it, it, the theory is doomed from the start whereas Tesla had invented a frictionless rotary engine that has no contact and actually makes the compression not through friction of parts touching it does it through adhesion and viscosity um, which superheated steam has a better viscosity than air uh, but the ultimate is cold steam um, because it's got the highest viscosity and it can move at supersonic to hypersonic speeds. Which is what this is all about. Sure. Also, one of the important factors is that the, the, supersonic, uh, the supersonic speed is actually affected by temperature and the hotter the temperature, the higher the speed of sound. The colder the temperature, the lower the speed of sound. So, so you can actually achieve uh, supersonic at, at, room t at room temperature. Room temperature, yeah, that's or possible. Or even uh, for practical purposes, outside at maybe five Celsius or whatever. 
Sure. I mean, the higher that you fly, if, if this machine is going to be used for aviation, the colder it is, so uh, the supersonic speed comes down. And also, the, the viscosity of the air is thinner, which is why planes fly higher, because they can move faster. Now, um, what have you, uh, I mean, at the point about, the point about uh, Tesla, he was using egg-shaped bearings. That was his way of getting sure. uh, to keep the discs at the, in, the, in the center and not move laterally in one way or another. That's right. What sort of bearings have you been developing, and what about these discs? Uh, we've been developing uh, what's called aerostatic uh, bearings, which uh, have to use a um, compressed air from a, a tank. Um, we're also working on uh, aerodynamic bearings, which don't need air from a tank. Um, the problem with aerodynamic bearings is they're not frictionless from a standstill, and they cost a lot of money to develop because they're uh, extremely uh, high tolerance part. I mean, doing anything frictionless is, 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 is a big sure. deal. I mean, we, we talk about these uh, theoretical terms, frictionless, but I mean, you're talking real world engineering here with friction and, and tolerances and, and you know, nothing's perfect in the real engineering world, but how are you achieving this? Or, or, or rather, you're not achieving it. This is stuff you can not quite buy off the shelf well, it is stuff you can buy off the shelf. Right? Well, we've found um, there's various different air bearing manufacturers. Uh, in particular, we've been looking at aerostatic bearings because they're frictionless from zero RPM. They're frictionless from standstill, um, which is uh, when you're prototyping and the machine is going to be in a static location. Uh, it's, it's the cheaper way uh, to do it. And the way that we've achieved it is by studying the three US manufacturers uh, called OAV, uh, New Way uh, and Speciality Components. And they all make what, what are called porous carbon media air, air bearings, which uses a metal housing and a uh, graphite carbon insert with uh, a porosity of about 16 to 22% and the gaps between the axle and the uh, graphite is around four microns to, to about 20 microns, depending on the pressure used, um, which is a, a high-end engin engineering uh, job, because it's, it's precision engineering. Now you were talking about graphite, I think, on the phone, and how difficult it is to get the graphite. Well, I think because, I mean, we've sussed it out now, um, because in, in England uh, none of these bearings are made, um, the Americans knew uh, exactly what graphite, uh, what grade, what the density, uh, what the grain size, what the porosity needed to be, because the, the three manufacturers that make these bearings are in America. Um, so we, we've now got contacts uh, in America called Advanced Carbon, uh, Jeff from Advanced Carbon, and uh, the, there's a, an English company as well, um, I think it's Olmec, uh, off the top of my head, and uh, it's a chap called Paul, uh, another Paul. And um, I'm also buying some from eBay from a company called Polymet in Germany. Right, it's wonderful, it's just, just, we're dealing with revolutionary advanced engineering here, and you go on onto eBay and buy this one. Yeah. So, um, so where does that, where is that, uh, Contributing. What's what have you done so far? Okay, we um, were here in November before the lockdown. Do, do you um, mean with the air bearings or in it, what have we, uh, you know, made, manufactured so far? Really, the, the whole lot. Okay. What have you physically done so far? Because okay. this is all laid out beautifully with all a whole lot of uh, uh, stuff that's all perfectly laid out in perspex and all sorts of stuff. You got a magnificent display here down in Plymouth. Uh, so. What have you been doing? You've, you showed some pretty impressive stuff last, uh, before Christmas, before lockdown. Okay, um, well, we've built um, various different five inch Tesla turbine uh, and we've been using acrylic as the casing because primarily our mission is to show an educational version so people can actually see the rotor inside the casing spinning and that way nobody can claim that there's something inside the casing like an atomic battery or 
hamster running in a wheel <laughs> or anything like that. Be very, very exhausted hamster at yeah. supersonic speeds. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've made uh, a very large pump, which has got an 800 uh, millimeter rotor. Um, what do you call large? Well, the, the casing's four foot by four foot. So um, in terms of the, the rotor diameter is, um, is about 31 and a half inches, 800 millimeters. So it's quite a, it's quite a big diameter rotor. Um, so we've, we've been prototyping that. Uh, we've had to shelve that for a little bit because it's very expensive to make a metal version. Um, but what do you mean by very expensive? I mean, if somebody was wanted to try to help you, what, what's the deal there? What makes it expensive? What do you need? Okay, well, with, with the pump, um, if you're looking to run a pump uh, or, or a uh, vacuum pump, um, or a compressor, which is all, all quite similar of Tesla's designs. If you're looking to run that at supersonic speeds, um, the, the centrifugal force is very immense and it, it needs uh, something called finite element analysis, FEA, um, carried out on the design because... Sorry, finite? Finite, finite, finite element analysis. Okay. And that basically puts the design into, into a CAD package which works out where the, the strong points are, where the weak points are, and it can run a simulation uh, rather than you having to do it in, r in real time. And, um, and have things blow up and... Well, that, the, pu the pump compressor or vacuum pump can, uh, you know, potentially cause um, a, a, an explosion of parts. So a, super, a supersonic machine of, of one of those three is... Um, you know, it's, it's very high-end engineering. When, whereas when you come to the turbine or the rotary engine, uh, even Tesla himself states that it doesn't matter when it breaks, it, it won't explode, it will implode, so the parts will collapse into the center. Whereas with the pump or the compressor or the vacuum pump, they are thrown out from the center. I mean, this is why uh, factories and turbine halls have to have a very light roof. So if things do go by and they go up. Sure. Well. This, this is why I've been putting uh, my efforts into uh, making the turbine supersonic because um, it's the safe machine. And then the trick is to use the turbine as the uh, machine that taps into uh, over the heat source from uh, superheated steam, the speed and expansion of cold steam, which can move at supersonic to hypersonic speeds and has a massive rate of expansion uh, compared to superheated steam, or use ambient air, uh, atmospheric pressure and ambient heat, um, which has to have uh, frictionless bearings to operate to create a te temperature differential. Because if you don't have the frictionless bearings, uh, the, the ambient heat and atmospheric pressure will be converted to kinetic energy and the ball bearings will convert that back to heat. So if you, if you imagine a front door of a building when you open it and you've got a draft and the back door slams shut, having ball bearings is the back door slamming shut. You've shut the window to uh, harness in nature, whereas with friction bearings, you've actually opened Which the door. Which is doors. what they basically do with modern electrical engineering. Uh, they, they collapse the, the fundamental first uh, that, that gate that opens up the electric, that when you generate electricity, is opened and then collapsed again. Are you talking about back EMF? Yeah. Harnessing the back yeah. EMF? Yeah. Uh, well, it's not quite as, uh, it could be much more eloquently explained, but the, we, the way we generate electricity using a conventional um, generator is we, we collapse it so you have to put more in and open it up again, and that's why it needs fuel. Now, what applications? Are you planning for this technology? Okay, um, the ones that uh, we're working on are uh, power generation, uh, electricity generation, uh, pumping water, um, compressed air, silent compressors. So normally compressors are really noisy. Tesla's machine uh, is extremely quiet. So because uh, you, you can get screw compressors, piston I mean, compressors. But basically, if you've got noise or heat coming from something, it's inefficient. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, I've got a piston compressor in my workshop and I can't speak to anyone when it's on. I have to just wait for it to fill the tank and 
and uh, if it kicks in when I'm working, I can't speak to anyone, so I just have to kill, kill the conversation. So that's that's one of the things. So there's um, there's a vacuum pump, which again, uh, you can have a, a quiet vacuum pump. Conventional vacuum pumps are very noisy. I've got a couple, and you can't really hold much of a conversation with those on either. So there's the turbine, uh, the rotary engine, the compressor, the vacuum pump, um, and and the pump. So the so the pump is for pumping water. The vacuum pumps for making vacuum. The compressors for making compressed air, uh, or it could be used for propulsion. Uh, the turbine is uh, used for converting uh, the heat from superheated steam uh, into uh, rotational velocity um, and using ambient uh, air and atmospheric pressure it is possible to rapidly condense the water vapour from air and the, what comes out of the exhaust is cold air and distilled water. Uh, so we, there's also an aviation version which we've briefly spoke about um, there's a couple of variations of that there's the vehicle version and there's also a hovercraft which Tesla drew a picture of in 1908 and we found the picture in the museum in uh, Serbia in the Nikola Tesla Museum so are we talking replacing jet engines and aeroplanes or actually replacing the whole plane concept with wings in the first place? Are we talking about car engines or are we talking about a new way of generating electricity which um, doesn't use those stupid um, turbines we see outside? Well, all of that really. Um, we could replace the uh, jet engines that we use on planes and still like, we could retrofit this to uh, existing planes. Um, we could completely change the design. Um, we could have this on retrofitted to vehicles. In fact, uh, Nikola Tesla's last ever patent application, which was denied in America, was for a retrofit two-stage turbine and vacuum pump on one axle uh, with a pulse detonation engine. So it was designed to run on uh, superheated steam. So instead of having a tank of petrol, we'd have a tank of water and uh, a tank of a tank of water, a 60 litre tank of water can become uh, many, many times more. I mean, for example, when you boil water at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the, the volume of uh, 1,000 litres is increased by 1,700 times. So, so what does that mean from a practical point of view? You could actually fill up with some water and then drive for 1,000 miles or something? Well, the... the um, the length of time that you'd be able to drive with the same size fuel tank would be uh, substantially improved, but you wouldn't have to use you wouldn't have to use water um, if you have a supersonic uh, one of the stage if you've got a two stage machine and one of the stages is supersonic, then you can harness atmospheric pressure and ambient heat and use that as fuel. It's nowhere near as powerful as superheated steam or cold steam, but it's it's powerful enough um, to drive around and not run out of fuel. So essentially you've got a, you can't say a fuelless car because there is a fuel and it's not perpetual motion because the energy is not coming from nowhere. It's coming from the fact there's 10 plus miles of sky above us compressing the, the air uh, down to 14.7 PSI at sea level. And the heat is uh, coming from the sun. So essentially what we're doing is we're tapping into the largest heat engine in the world which is the solar heat engine that we live in and uh, I mean often the way to get an engine or get some kind of thing to work is to be able to substitute it into existing cars so manufacturers don't run away screaming from you um, so is that is that the sort of thing that you're, you're looking for definitely um, I mean why chuck away a load of decent motors uh, that already exist when you could have a retrofit system. I mean, people are already retrofitting other engines into other cars and some people are fitting LPG to, uh, to cars. So, you know, if, if people can do that, then why can't we retrofit this to existing cars and instead of using the, the plastic petrol or diesel tank for, for petrol or diesel, we can use it for, use it for water, um, yeah. Why so, I, I mean, if, 
so this is something which is a practical thing that you're actually developing so you can actually show that uh, you've got this this technology which physically will produce work uh, at the end of the day either generating electricity or making things move in in in, in, in front you know, in, in, in a car or something sure well is that ultimately what you're aiming for? yeah the, the primary goal for myself is to show uh, a supersonic tesla turbine and show it doing work with no input other than uh, initially compressed air from a, a compressed air cylinder then disconnect the compressed air cylinder and, and just in other use, words you need to start it yeah there's got to be a, all engines have got an idle speed and uh, the idle speed of a single stage tesla turbine or a single stage uh, rotary engine vacuum pump pump or compressor is supersonic uh, i personally wouldn't like to start a supersonic compressor because um, it would propel itself um, and who knows where it would end um, but with the turbine we'd be harnessing atmospheric pressure and ambient heat and converting that to torque uh, so that's the safe machine that needs to be shown supersonic on frictionless bearings and then hooked up to what's called a, a, an engine dyno which can measure the horsepower and torque and we can test it to uh, its limit. And then it's a case of generating a gearbox system which would get the gearbox out. How, how do you accelerate, how do you decelerate? Okay, well this is where it gets really interesting and uh, yeah, but it's, it's great having this thing Tesla. working. Yeah. Um, because when, when you've got a two-stage machine, uh, the, the, uh, the supersonic machine, it stays supersonic all the time. And if you've got a supersonic uh, vacuum pump or pump, then the Tesla turbine is completely speed controllable and you can fit uh, a throttle body on it very similar to what you find on a, a petrol engine and uh, you can control the amount of flow uh, through the turbine and have a stop so that the, the, uh, the flap doesn't completely close so you've got an idle speed and then you can open that and close it and, and, and uh, control the, the speed of, of the one machine whilst the other speed the speed of the other machine still goes supersonic so you take the drive off the speed controllable axle so this is a twin axle machine I'm talking about there is another version where you can have uh, two stages or even three stages on one axle um, but that's a bit like having a, a supercharged uh, turbine as opposed to having um, a two stage twin axle which allows that it, the, the gearbox between the two stages is the airflow between them. They're actually geared by air, um, by vacuum, um, by the vortex going from between one stage to the second stage. And that's how Tesla, Tesla writes in his patent that there's no need for a transmission uh, with his two stage system because um, the, the one is going supersonic and you're not taking a a load off that and, and the other one's completely speed controlled which you are taking a load off. Which means you don't have a whole lot of bearings with friction and oil and um, taking away a lot of the efficiency of this whole engine. Then. That's right, there's no, no, no oil, um, both, both rotors are floating and they're geared by uh, essentially air loops, uh, air doing uh, vortex paths, um, which is extremely uh, clever and uh, efficient way of uh, tr the, tra the transmission of energy. I mean, no, are, are these, sorry? Um, Tesla, Tesla actually writes in his patent um, that one's a transmitter and one's a receiver. Yeah. Now where, how do you propose to actually get that put into a manufacturing of getting this? What's your aim right now, the, the work that you're doing? When you get up in the morning, what are you aiming for at the end of the day? Okay, well, this is an open source project and um, we've managed to keep it open source uh, by uh, publishing uh, the files, the, the computer-aided design files um, publicly and writing about uh, in, a, in a various diaries and, and YouTube channels on our progress and what we've achieved so far. Could you just say what those YouTube channels are for the sure. purposes of the uh, uh, conference? My YouTube channel is called Grav Inert, which is G R A V, which is in, as in gravity, and inert as in inertia, which is I N E R T. And um, the channel's uh, been going for uh, nearly a couple of years now. And 
it's starting to grow. Uh, we've got an American research partner called I Energy Supply, which is the letter I, then energy, then supply, one word. Uh, if you put that into the search bar in, in YouTube, uh, you'll find either of those. We've got another Englishman called Rob Meads, that's R-O-B, and then M-E-A-D-E-S, and he is uh, pioneering uh, my 3D printed uh, one inch uh, rotor design so that um, people who can't afford to build um, com commercial versions can still get involved and, and learn and teach. Uh, I was, in fact, I was approached by um, a pastor in, in, in America who has uh, children who want to learn about Tesla and they're replicating the one inch 3D printed design. He's got five children who's teaching. So um, there, there are a few others uh, on the, uh, who are coming into this now. There's, there's far more people who are understanding the true potential of um, you know, the capabilities of, of Tesla's machines. And the, it's, trend, it's trending at the minute. Um, it, this, is, this is growing exponentially. Uh, into uh, something very beautiful that anyone can be a part of. Now, what's to stop Mr. Mr. Big driving up here in his limousine? Uh, because this has happened with a lot of, um, uh, shall we say, zero-point energy technology. They hand you a big check to shut up uh, or, or take everything you developed and just patent it themselves and, and silence it. Or you just suddenly find that you've got to have a road accident one day. What about that? Well, there's always a risk of um, these sorts of things in this field, and uh, someone or some people just have to be cavaliers and uh, put their lance down and, and charge ahead, uh, in the hope that somebody else will pick up the torch and carry on. Because a lot of this fails when you actually do get into an, into an industrial thing. Somebody just buys your company from you. Sure. I mean, my, uh, my research shows that all inventors of um, these sorts of technologies, um, the big mistake that they made is they tried to uh, keep it a secret or they kept some sort of trade secret. Whereas, you know, we didn't invent this. We, we're just uh, innovating uh, the machines yeah, and replicating that's, using that's, that's modern a, materials. That's a golden rule that if you want to stay alive tell everybody about it. Exactly that's it and that's where all the inventors have failed in the past because they've been hell-bent on making money to pay them for all their hard efforts um, whereas what we're doing is we're, we're giving it away to the world because that is what Nikola Tesla intended. I mean his all his patents are, are lessons. Every single patent is a lesson. And if you copy the diagrams and the text word for word, you will end up with a working machine and the rest of the words that didn't make sense will make sense. And that's happened with everything that we've replicated so far, um, uh, including uh, Tesla did some later work in, in the 1930s on cold steam generator nozzles. Yeah, a lot of people think that Tesla was sort of shut away somewhere and he didn't do any anymore. But, um, but what actually happened? Sure, well from uh, 1900 to about 1930 Tesla was uh, pushing superheated steam and high, high partial vacuum as the, um, the fuel, the ultimate fuel for his machines. When he got to the, the 30s um, when Tesla would have been in his 70s, Tesla uh, made, made a, an article called Our Future Motive Power. If you, if you Google it, uh, Nikola Tesla, Our Fut Future Motive Power, you'll find the article on various websites. And that is when he converted from superheated steam to cold steam. And because he'd realized A, it's safer, B, it can move at much faster speeds, C, the speed of sound is uh, less in cold than it is in hot and also that you could have a limitless uh, supply of energy from a water source such as a river, well, sea, uh, lake, 
uh, or borehole and uh, essentially turn the water from that source into cold steam uh, water vapour, run that through the machine, harness the, the elasticity of, of it expanding because cold steam expands at a much, much higher rate than, than superheated steam and it also moves at much faster speeds. So you could convert that elasticity, uh, expansion and speed into uh, kinetic energy and the beauty about that is then it comes out of the exhaust and drops straight back into where the water came from in the first place. Now could you fly this thing in space? Um, well, I've set myself a challenge that before I die, I, I build one of Tesla's flying machines and I go up into the upper strata with, a, with breathing equipment and film it. Um, how high we can go, I have no idea, but I'm willing to give it a shot. <laughs> well, that's, that's an amazing thing. Now, the, the thing is, is that this is one part of Tesla's technology. You've been discussing that he was able to develop other, other means of communication, or is that something you want to talk about? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've come across a couple of things called, um, one of them is called the Spirit Radio, uh, which is, uh, bit ha has been replicated. I think it was released in a magazine called The Electrical Experimenter somewhere between 1910 and 1920. I couldn't give you an exact date. And now there's a lot of fads and stuff going around on at that time. You know, people talking to ghosts and all sure. that sort of stuff. Well, what exactly do you mean by that? I mean, well, would that not discredit um, Tesla? Well, the, the strange thing is, I mean, there's a couple of people on YouTube that have replicated uh, the design from, from the electrical experimenter. And um, it's actually uh, two antennas and there's no batteries. and they plug it into a jack port on, uh, on a PC and they speak to the, the antennas and there are voices coming back and where are they coming from and, and how is it coming back with no power source is a bit of an unknown. Um, is this something a little bit like Kirchhoff's mirrors but is it, is it something to do with... They kind of look like lollipops. Can you explain the detail? They're like, lolly, they're, they're like antennas that go up and then the, the, there's a spiral but they, they're not connected to any source of energy. And, uh, and I'll be honest, I've not researched like it enough to understand it. A Lakovsky oscillator? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It, they do look similar to those antennas, they, they do. Um, I, I haven't researched it enough to understand it, but I do know that um, there are various articles where Tesla claimed that he was talking uh, to uh, Venusians and... Um, now, what do, I mean by, what do you mean by... Uh, this is, I think, um, there has been some talk about that. Uh, um, I remember um, <laughs> Professor Lathwaite discussed that at the Institute of Electrical Engineers a long time ago in central London. Um, but uh, when you're talking about these coils, is it what do you mean by the co coil? What type of coil is it? Uh, is it a bifiler coil where it means you've got the positive and negative uh, rotational uh, currents flying in there? What, what? What's happening there? Well, together they might be a bifiler coil, but I'll be honest, I've not looked at the circuit diagram or In thought, or thought about rec replicating it. They kind of look like, if you can imagine copper brake pipe wrapped into a lollipop shape, that's kind of what they look like. And there's two of them, so um, possibly it's they are bifiler. what electrical engineers would call a non-inductive winding, because you have an, a plus L and a minus L sign. I'm, I'm not able to, to fully um, because you comment on this because I, I've, not, I've not studied it enough. But what I can say is there are articles about Tesla talking to other planets. And I know the establishment used this against him to make him out to be a madman. And Tesla had an assistant called Arthur Matthews who d did a patent uh, for a turbine after Tesla's death and also did a patent uh, which was called a visual telegraph and in Arthur Matthews book which was released in 1969 uh, Arthur Matthews showed the uh, the diagram for the Mark 1 and Mark 2 uh, visual telegraph which was known as the Tesla scope and they claimed that it was the piece of equipment for talking to people on other planets so I've not really gone into it like massively, but I, I know about it As and it's interesting. In, it seems to something like that was displayed in the Flash Gordon films of the 1930s. 
Maybe I'd, I haven't seen it. <laughs> but it is interesting though, but it's a, it's a total topic of uh, research and development for someone other than me, I think. Uh, I've got too many other things on, but I hope yeah. somebody does replicate it and um, work out what is going on there, because I think there's been enough information to replicate it. So it's just going to take someone with, the, with that kind okay, of inclination right. to do um, it. Let's, let's get down to, to, to business. Let's get down to what are you doing right now? Where are your plans and, or, or what you want to say? Uh, and uh, if, if somebody was watching here that they wanted to contact you, what sort of skills are you looking for? What sort of things are the nuts and bolts? What sort of material assets do you want to sort of okay. look for? Well, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm working with a, a small team of people uh, in England uh, who are uh, building uh, some of my latest designs uh, for the supersonic Tesla turbine. Um, I'm also working with a new engineering team who are based in Sweden, uh, who are building uh, some of my latest designs as well. Um, the, it, their cousin uh, is based in Iceland and uh, we're in discussions about making a film to explain uh, about Tesla's struggles of uh, how, how he was suppressed and, and uh, where this could go, you know, the big idea and um, how this could change the world. Um, I'm working with uh, various people in America and various other people dotted around the world. Um, some people are just uh, interested on a purely on, on a student level. Uh, some people are interested on a commercial level. Uh, I am quite happy to act as a consultant for anyone who's interested in building these commercially. Uh, I'm not. I'm not looking for any type of business partnership, but I am. I am uh, quite happy to act as a consultant for anyone who is looking to go commercial with this. And uh, in the meantime, I shall be refining uh, the the builds that I'm doing in England and advancing the designs uh, as I communicate with all of these contacts around the world. Now, at the very start of this, you, you sort of mentioned about those mechanical engineers uh, and the way that they've been t t taught, and, and you, were, you were thankful that you hadn't been trained in that way, so you're able to think differently. What are the crucial basic things that you're talking about there in terms of why would a mechanical engineer goes to, to college and get, walks out with a BSc or whatever? What is wrong with that type of thinking that they're trained in? Because, I mean, why are they wrong and you are right? Um, or is that even the right question? Well, I'd say that you know Nikola Tesla was the greatest mechanical engineer uh, in modern times. Maybe there's been um, others in you know I mean, many, 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 many times. There were the other working in that environment at the time, weren't they? Well, he was a mechanical engineer before he was an electrical engineer. And um, I would say that uh, if you've been to university and got a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, you know you, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of uh, a foundation to be able to design um, machines that will do all manner of uh, complicated uh, tasks. Um, I mean, that's a, the, those are heavy courses. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. you have a, have a lot of stuff to learn. You've got to have a lot of stuff in your head. Sure, uh, like a free uh, degree, isn't it? Yeah, um, for for um, you know a bachelor degree. Um, but the main thing is that the uh, the the laws of thermodynamics, um, the second law in particular, I, I did touch on earlier, uh, is based on the work of Saidi Carnot. So all heat engines, uh, that's all combustion engines and turbines, are compared to the theoretical frictionless piston engine of say 28 year old Sadie Carnot and that is flawed from the start because you can't have a, a frictionless piston engine so even though it's theoretical it's flawed and that is fundamentally well, your, your theory is fundamentally impossible exactly but um, then you're talking about frictionless bearings in this yeah in this Tesla thing so I mean is that not impossible well Tesla's Tesla's engine is frictionless. Uh, frictionless bearings are real. 
They were invented in 1904 by George Westinghouse, who was the inventor of the air brake for trains. Uh, before there was air brakes on trains, there was men standing on top of the trains with a, a paddle, and uh, it was supposed to be one of the, the most dangerous jobs you could ever have. What do you mean, a paddle? Like, well, like uh, a, a brake, you know, paddle to uh, a lever to uh, make the train stop. So there were multiple men on top of the trains, and if a cow stepped out on the line, then, uh, you know, there's a good chance that they might hit it uh, and they wouldn't be able to stop in time. Um, so George Westinghouse invented the air brake for trains, but then he invented the atmospheric turbine bearing, which was the frictionless bearing for turbines. And, and Nikola Tesla uh, made his own version, which was uh, a much simpler version. I mean, what do hard drives, I mean, these disks, for somebody who looked at them, they look pretty similar to what you'd see in a computer hard drive. And a computer hard drive spinning, a lot of the reasons why hard drives fail is because the bearings fail or the design sure. of their design well, well, modern hard drives do actually have uh, aerodynamic bearings, so they're using atmospheric pressure. And um, there's another type of aerodynamic bearings which have a herringbone pattern etched into the shaft. And as the herringbone pattern is spun, it creates pressure and, and pushes what's called a foil bearing away from the shaft. Um, some. I mean, that's where uh, a lot of the damage happens in a hard drive when it spins up and it's, if yeah. you sit it's sitting around for a long period of time, yep. I don't know how long it is, but when, when you spin that up, a few first few microseconds, that's where the damage is done. Sure. I mean, how, how does this not happen with what you're talking about? With your okay, well, well, with aerostatic bearings, the, the compressed air from a tank uh, creates an air cushion. So as soon as the, the rotor, the one moving part is spun, it's, it's already in a non-contact position. And right, there, that's the important thing about this system, is you're only dealing with one moving part. That's correct. It, in, a, in a single stage machine, one moving part. In a two stage machine, there's two moving parts. But one moving part per turbine or, or per pump. And uh, with, a, with a hard drive, if they're using aerodynamic bearings, which are also known as self-acting bearings, uh, that's that's actually got a, a self-acting uh, bearing as well, which would actually would have been started by uh, putting a vacuum pump on the exhaust, which would allow atmospheric pressure to rush in and uh, create the air cushion. Um, with the hard drives, you, you're perfectly correct saying that, you know, there is a tiny bit of contact on start up and stop. Like, like, a, like I would compare a hard drive to a, like a diesel engine on a cold day, starting up for the first time and all that friction happening, that's when the damage is done. Sure, the faster they go, the, the, uh, the more pressure they make, so it pushes, the, uh, it pushes the, the bit that was in contact away from the axle that's spinning. And um, yeah, they're known as self-acting bearings or aerodynamic bearings, um, but the, like well, I say, um, Okay, well, for those uh, interested in, in following up your work, um, um, just, just one final mention, uh, if they want to contact you, uh, you've got a, a, have you got a website or anything like that? Or? Sure, um, I've got uh, an email address, which is my name, Paul Townley, P-A-U-L-T-O-W-N-L-E-Y, at rocketmail.com, which is R-O-C-K, E T M A I L dot com C O M. Well, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, for the online basis 2020 uh, summer of, uh, of this horrendous lockdown, this uh, whole situation that we're in. Um, and thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and um, just uh, we'll, we'll go a little bit further uh, and edit something afterwards. But thank you very much for coming to the basis, or me coming down to see you in Cornwall. Uh, at the 2020 conference uh, online for BASIS 2020. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Miles. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, really good questions, and I uh, hope everyone learned something new. And uh, if you want to get in touch, feel free to message me. Uh, you know, the only stupid question uh, is the question that you don't ask. Good, good point.